Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much for the invite. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Ple pleasure to have you. Such an esteemed athlete such as yourself. I've had a, a blast diving into your athletic background. Wow. That's very generous. I'm interesting to hear what you've... Um, what what like, I found? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, well, you know, and maybe we could even start here. Um, I mean, look, you're incredibly accomplished in college, national player of the year. Uh, I think you were the second overall pick, right, for the National Women's Soccer League, and, and you won Rookie of the Year. And then uh, remember that amazing uh, World Cup run for Costa mm -hmm. Rica in 2015. Um, right, so there, there's no probably shortage of, like, topics athletically that we could dive into, but, but what I would love to hear about is um, you know your actual path to coming and playing in the states in hmm. college out out of Costa Rica? How how did that opportunity kind of come about for you? And and is that typical or was that truly kind of like a unique situation that you created that, for yourself? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I think I had a really clear when I was like a girl. I already knew that I wanted to play professional soccer. I was just so passionate about it since a young age. Hmm. Um, but I was born and raised in Costa Rica, which I absolutely love my home country. But especially at the time, the opportunities weren't, there were not many opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I already knew at a young age that I, in order to, you know, go out for my dreams, like I had to leave my country. And hmm. somehow my dad knew about the so-called like athletic scholarships <laughs> um, for college here in the U.S. And he would uh. always tell me um, like he was a huge influence, not only in soccer, but also like having that mentality of like, you know, go, get out there and take advantage of soccer, get your studies and then, you know, and then we'll see what happens. But uh, that's sort of how it like that mentality that I had started. Yeah. And um, as I grew up, though, like it was you said, if it's like a it, it doesn't happen often, especially there's like a couple of players that I can think of, including myself, who have been able to play overseas and hmm. stay there. You know, there, a lot of players have gone overseas and they come back to Costa Rica um, just because. Uh, the lack of opportunity and the lack of resources, it's really hard to thrive and then to go out and compete against the best in the world. And, and yeah. you know what I mean? Like it's the right. development is just different. <laughs> yeah. And and has that development uh, begun to change in Costa Rica with some of the success that the women's team has had? Or is there, is there still a lot of ground to make up? There is still a lot of ground to make up. Like, so a couple of things that have changed um, from when I was there, and I was like in, you know, I was an adolescent. Um, so now at least the players get stipend because um, mm. you can't call that. It's not a salary at all. So it's more like a stipend to help them. Um, but the players, they all, I think all the teams train, and including the national team, we have to train early in the morning, like 5 a.m., 6 a.m., because players have to go and work because oh, they, wow. they need to live off of something and soccer is not it. So um, that just says sort of like it's a totally different reality. Um, now the national tournament, uh, it's an amateur tournament, but at least mm. now they're being televised uh, once one game per weekend. It's being televised, I think, at least one game per weekend. Um, but, you know, when and so people in Costa Rica are saying like, you know, yes, there's more support, this and that, but you have to understand we we are in the area of CONCACAF and there's two top 10 t the world the world cup champion is in our area which is the US right. um right. and then you got Canada which is also top 10 in the world consistently and then and then you have Mexico who when you compare it resource wise um 5 or 6 years ago they started um with they established like a professional league and, mm. and they had a vision, right? So for the first five years, they had this like law that there were no international players 
in the league, right? So you can see that oh, they wow. wanted to start to develop and they have like a vision and they want to compete. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, of course, they have like world class stadiums and facilities. They can do that. Um, but when I think of Costa Rica, like, OK, yes, maybe we don't have the same facilities, but there must be something better that we can do. They're, like, let's use what we have in order to get better. But that's where I'm like, I feel like we're just losing that. I don't know if it's a competitive edge. I don't know if it's indifference. Um mm. I don't know if it's like we're our worst enemy because <laughs> it's already hard enough when we go and compete out internationally. Um, the players who are playing in Costa Rica, it, the intensity is just not the same, right? So it's oh, always okay. a shock. It's always a shock when we go called to national team and, you know, our national team coach is trying to, you know, get the players to get into that, like, intensity of play once we start whatever tournament we're at international tournament representing Costa Rica it's always like yeah. the first game is always like a slap on the face it's like okay welcome back to to the international level so to answer your question though it's like some things have changed but I like even so you see Jamaica too other hmm. other teams and countries who aren't necessarily uh ranked whatever number in the world they're also getting better. <laughs> you know, uh, Jamaica has a lot of players playing in the U.S. And oh wow, for example, right? And and yeah, we, we have some players playing in Europe, others in the U.S. It's not consistent though, and it it's like you if you sleep on it, like you, you will wake up one day and be like, whoa, like the competition is getting better. Play, like other countries are busy trying to get better and i feel like we can just stay behind and i feel like mm. it's already happening hmm. so well, it's frustrating <laughs> no I, I i can't i can't even imagine well and you know for for you to come from costa rica come to the states be the national player of the year right um did, did you know early on and like i guess was it identified within even costa rica that like you were an exceptional talent or was it, has it been kind of like a long road and kind of through some of this stuff, like, you know, mindset and determination that you've kind of like built yourself into the player that you are today? And I, I imagine there's a, there's a, there's a answer there where it probably is both. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I was going to say that. Uh, I think, I don't know, like, especially nowadays, I feel like talent is just like the starting point. Like, mm. you know, but at the time, yes, like I, I feel like people around me and coaches and my dad used to play professional soccer in Costa Rica. So he's the oh, one, okay. he's like, he loves soccer and he's hmm. my number one fan. And he's always, he was always really tough on me, but he always says, you know, I was tough on you because I know like how good you were or could be. Yeah. So I think that he was the first one who saw like, Oh, like she has a lot of potential. Let's get on it. Yeah. And um, eventually when I started, like I made my first women's team ever, like we didn't even know there were a women's team, but I was, uh, I was turning 11. Imagine <laughs> that. Like I was turning 11 when we just knew that there was a, a women's soccer team. Um, so yes, I, I feel like I had, you know, the, the technical skills and stuff. Um, and then it, it, there became a point where I, you know, I kept growing. I, I, I was, um, my dad, like, it's, this is, I don't know if it's going to make sense in English, but it's like literal hmm. translation. It's uh, make sure you, you burn uh, each step, like burn the stages or whatever, like faces. So it's, he's been, I was just like developing, right? Like I was growing yeah. like step by step. Uh, but there came a point where I was like, okay, I think I'm ready to go. I'm just. I feel like no one knows about me. <laughs> like yeah. I, I need a scout to see me. I need like the national national team and the competitions with the national team was like, was the best shot I think I had to, to be exposed into college because I had it right. really clear. I, I wanted to go to college first before going professionally. And I feel like it was a good transition anyways, because it was like a lot, like I, I wasn't ready at that age to, go professionally i feel like there's players like that uh yeah. and it's becoming more uh like normal now for women to 
not go to college and go straight to professional soccer. But for me, uh, I knew college was going to be still very competitive. Uh, and I got really, I don't like the word luck because it was too, the match was too perfect uh, for me to say that it was luck. But um, mm. when my Penn State soccer coach saw me, it was during a, a tournament that our national team, the U20s got invited to and the Penn State head coach was coaching one of those teams. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. So that was just how it happened. But had that not happened, I don't know where I would have huh. been or what yeah. would have happened, you know? Well, that's what I was wondering. It's like, you know, are, are colleges uh, taking the time to like go to Central and South America and like, you know, are they keeping an eye on like top tier young talent? And like, is it common that they're getting recruited to the States? But um, it almost sounds like, you know, you're even like if, if that game hadn't happened against that coach, I'm not sure. I <laughs> I'm, I not, been I'm not sure. And, and then you have to add another layer of like there's so many filters, too, because because I knew in the back of my head, like, OK, it's college. I I was again, I say it's coincidence, but mm. me and my brother, my dad is a P, used to be a, t, a PE teacher, like a physical education teacher. OK, awesome. and um so me and my brother, he worked in like American school. Hmm. So me and my brother had a scholarship to go to that school. And that's how we learned English. Oh, so we okay. knew pretty decent English. Um, and so I just, I had to keep my grades up anyways because of the scholarship, but also like for college. Like, so D1 right. schools, like it just, um, you have to have a certain level of uh, capacity to speak English in order sure. to even survive there. So many players like not all players have finished high school even and it, yeah. it's almost like the social problems are also obstacles to mm. you can be great at soccer but i mean i guess there's where thank god for professional soccer right but i'm just saying like college soccer and to get to a competitive college uh there's so many other filters as well other than like soccer and, and yeah. the athleticism and the level, right? Right, right, right. And, and how how was that process for you, right? Because um, I mean, look, <sighs> it was just a just like, well, that's what I was gonna say. For any <laughs> any eighteen year old old kid, like the kid who grows up in Montana and goes to the East Coast for the first time, is like, oh god, mm -hmm. what a cold shock. But like, you're coming from another country. It's, I mean, it sounds like you spoke it earlier, but it, you know, I guess it's a second language. Like, how how was that transition? It was so tough. <laughs> You're real, okay. <laughs> it was so tough. Um, yeah. I think what kept me going was the fact that I had been through so much. Like, I had just been waiting for that opportunity that when it came, I was, like, ready to go. I was terrified. Hmm. But I think that the frustration at home was bigger than any other challenge that I could face. Like, I was just waiting for that amazing opportunity. And it wasn't – I mean, I wasn't going to, like, a horrible place. It was college. It was – I was going to play soccer. I was going to study and I was going to, you know, meet amazing people. And my coaches, to be honest, like they were very, they made me feel very, um, like they were, they went above and beyond to, to help me with that transition. They were well aware. Mm. Uh, and I think I must've been the first like Latin American Hispanic player that they had. I dare yeah. say that. So, um, yeah, when I first came, it was a shock in every way. Yes. Like cultural shock. Uh, the language, I thought I knew more than I actually did because I knew oh, okay. like textbook English. So I I had like a an, a slightly easier time during class than like than like outside of class because the slang and the jokes and even the technical soccer language, oh, it was wow. zero. I had to learn all that. And yeah, um, just it was the first time I was being away from home. I'm yeah. such a homebody too. So like I, I later, later learned that normally freshman kids go and their parents help them move in. Most of them. Right. <laughs> right. And, and don't get me wrong. Like I, as I say this, I, I had a family away from my family because the team just helped me out so much. And my mm. teammates, parents were there too. And my coaches and my teammates, but uh, it's still, you know, little things that, no one thinks about, but maybe an international player uh, has to deal with. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, of course, then the the huge. I, I didn't know what fitness was. 
<laughs> oh, re- okay. I, did, this is I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I thought I did. I mean, I, of course, I, I don't get me wrong. Like I, we trained and all, but the U S is like the fittest team in the world. Like that's mm. just, it, it, they've always had that standard and that's always been a correct, they take pride on that. Like it's been always a characteristic of their style of play. Yeah. Um, they, they're only getting better and better, like in, in more, uh, they have more and more tools. Like they've always been super athletic and then they're like, okay, we got to get better at our like technique. And then they just work on it and they get better at it. And now they have both of those things like that to, uh, to me, that's why one of the reasons why they're the best in the world, but I was introduced mm-hmm. to college soccer and it was so quick, like, so a lot of running than I was used to because I was playing in Costa Rica. Imagine in back mm. like 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. Um, right. So it was a lot of a shock. Oh yeah. I a bet. Lot of a shock. Well, and, and something I wanted to ask you too, when, when you mentioned you were kind of frustrated at home, was was that frustration with just like that lack of competition or are you talking like, is it, is it other issues that were going on and you were just like <laughs> kind of ready to go to that next step? I think I was frustrated with the lack of opportunity. Um, uh, so, oh, I mentioned too, that it was a nightmare, the whole process to get, to be eligible to play in college. Oh, yeah. Um, I think I was like, I was training so hard because I wanted to be re- ready to come to college. So um, I always say like the college system here is made so that ath- student athletes can thrive at doing both things. Hmm. But in Costa Rica, there's like, you got to figure it out on your own. Right. So I was mm. trying to train hard, but also trying to make up for the classes that I would miss. So it was all on me. Like, yes, yes, the my classmates and professors would help me out but i was the one calling i was the one like sleeping five hours the most sometimes uh yeah. and and i mean i you know a teenager needs to sleep and and i wasn't yeah. sleeping much right so i just was very frustrated and i was almost burned out at one point hmm. um and and then of course back then it was worse too like the training conditions weren't the best like the stipend we were getting was like almost like an insult. Like it's little things mm. like that, that I was like, I cannot wait to get out of here Yeah, because I, it's just a lot of um, sacrifice in a way. So I was just, it was frustration of like, yeah, just lack of opportunity, lack of uh, like interest to make the, oh. the conditions of na- like the national team better. Yeah. And, and just and women's it, soccer in Costa Rica better. Yeah. And it sounds too like, um, like the lack of like that support system, like you said, like the having to, to navigate it on your own and like, you know, it, there was no, nothing to like carry you along the process. It sounded like the way that uh, a lot of us are accustomed to here in the States. Yeah, exactly. Like no system in place, not even from the government, not from, you know, like, of course, a lot of people helped me throughout. And I mean, my family was, I mean, they probably it was probably harder for them than for me because they, you know, my mom knew that as soon as I would get home, like I need to eat, go study and go sleep. Right. So she would make sure that I had like something to eat as soon as I would get there. Like, and like there was a plenty of years because I started really young. So at one point my mom had to go from work, pick me up from school, get me to the field to train. Um, and then, like I said, like classmates would help me out. Like, of course, like I, I wouldn't have been, able to do any of this if I didn't have that help. But yeah. it's like, why, like, it's like the lack of support to our athletes at mm. home. Like it can be better and it should be better. It's been better in the last years. Um, but my frustration at that point was like, I am like, like striving for this mm-hmm. and I've hit rooftop already at home. So I was like, okay, like I'm ready to move on. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. No, that's, that's understandable. And so, so what was that experience like when you got to college, understanding that transition was tough? Uh, you mentioned that you hadn't, you hadn't truly been introduced to fitness yet. What, what was that experience like? <laughs> well, I can tell you my coaches have a lot of funny stories that I, I yeah. don't really remember many. I probably blacked out. <laughs> um, it was, it was amazing. I still have the memory of the very first game of our season. 
Okay. Uh, we had to go to uh, Virginia to play against UVA. Mm -hmm. And that conference is known, I'm sure still to this day, but at that time for sure, like that conference is known to be really like just shifty, skillful, like quick play, like one, two touch. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very simple soccer, very quick, but I couldn't keep up. I couldn't keep up. And it was like, I remember the coaches were like, well, welcome to like college soccer, blah, blah, blah. Right. And it was like, oh my gosh. Like it's, I, I didn't feel prepared and it was, I'm going to, I'm going to be very honest. Like during season, uh, preseason, I, <laughs> I was going, I was walking, I was in the building where our coaches, uh, offices were. And here I, I see coach, like we just bump against each other. She's like, oh, Rocky, how are you doing? Just like a casual, like she probably expected me to say, oh, good. Like have a nice yeah, day, whatever. Just, yeah, and just, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, and I just started bawling. <laughs> I was like, coach, like, um, but I came from a environment where like we were given absolutely nothing. And so I started mm. bawling because I felt like I didn't deserve to get the sneakers uh. that you get, the cleats that you get, all the gear and like a full scholarship. Yeah. I, I felt like I wasn't given back what I was given in a mm. way. So it was like a, even a shock in that sense, like. I, I learned that you had to, you didn't deserve things or you had to, you always do have to earn your spot or your, right, your salary, your whatever it is. Right. But also like, I, it was just two extremes. I feel like I came from a place where I um, had to figure it out on my own always to a place mm -hmm. where like, hey, whatever you need, just talk to us and we can figure it out. Right. So I just felt like, I wasn't deserving of being there. I, I was like, I'm not good enough to be here, you huh. know? And so coach had to deal with that. <laughs> she just sat, she was an ama amazing person. Like she's like, like another, they were both like m another mom for me, like just role models, more like moms, yeah, uh, more than moms. Um, but they, um, yeah, she just sat down with me and she was very, very nice. Like she handled it pretty well. She's like Rocky, like, you're just a freshman. Like I've already seen when you can do on the field, like you don't have to like just prove anything to me. Like I know what you can give and like you're a freshman, you're like, you're just mm -hmm. starting, like we'll take it one day at a time, blah, blah, blah. So, but like, that's, it was a lot for me in every sense, like just emotionally a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like any 18 year old kid, like that first year of college and like I, I play college football and I mean, it's yeah, it's a rude awakening. Um, and so and I can't even imagine trying to deal with that while being so far from home and then dealing with a language barrier. So forget all the challenging aspects of just being like a young college student or a young college athlete. It's like you're dealing with all these other headwinds as well that just probably make you feel uncomfortable. I'd have to imagine. <laughs> Uh, yes. So, so how, how did that tide start to turn for you? Because uh, as we as we look ahead to how that story ended, yeah. uh, you ended up excelling rather well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, state. exactly. I think I think my coaches were uh, <laughs> because the first and second year, okay. they were both really rough. There's a there's a term for the sophomore year, the sophomore, sophomore slump. Yes. Okay. Um, and I didn't know about it, but my sophomore year. Again, this is our, our postseason meetings with the coaches. Yeah. They asked me, how did you feel? And I just started bawling again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the, just the started bawling again. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> uh, awesome. I didn't cry that much. I'm just telling you the two times I cried. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um, no, but uh, yeah, the very because of very the two first years were very tough, the coaches were like – are you going to come back after the holidays? Like, make sure you get on that plane. <laughs> but yeah. I was like, no, I will for sure. Like, I'm, if anything, I'm a committed person. You know, I'm, I told them on that meeting, I feel like, because they asked me to come for the summer to train in college because mm -hmm. they were like, where are you going to train? Like, we have everything here. Like, I can't imagine there's a better setup for you in Costa Rica than here. And I was like, sure. okay, fair. Like, I get it. So, I came in a bit or like halfway through the summer yeah. to train and then season didn't go well for, for the team in general, but 
also for myself, I had like a weird, like, bur like body burnout sort of thing. And on that meeting, I told them I am willing to do anything that it takes. I just feel like I'm competing against, against like the best athletes in the world. And I, I, I just don't see the result. I don't, I don't see it. Like I don't see mm -hmm. it. And so I feel like it was a rough conversation, but then for my, uh, the third year and fourth year, it's when I started to, the place started to feel like home already because it was just a matter of time, I think, and yeah. experiences and have honest conversations. So the third year, um, I think it's common in college that the older players are like the captains usually, right? Um, yep. So now I had like a different role. They, you know, they... I think that the work that we had put in for the first and second year, although it wasn't at that point, it hadn't been like, I hadn't seen the best results. It still was worth it because thanks to what happened, we were able to adjust some things. And third and fourth year was like the cherry on top of my personal career. But as, as right. for the team, it was an amazing year. Um, and I think it was just a matter of time. Uh, the team culture that the coaches had been working on just like bloomed for those two years, especially the fourth year. Um, and I think as I started to feel more comfortable on this foreign, what used to be a foreign place uh, was more like home. Like I would look for, like I would miss my teammates now and like look forward to right, right, right. go back to college. And, and as also with my classmates, uh, the senior, right. The senior class, it was, there's something special about that. So now I'm like emotionally involved too and like invested and it all came, you know, it all came together. And of course, at this point, the soccer part too, I'm like, I'm, I'm now competing. I'm used to it. Like I'm trying to, yeah, yeah it's, it was like, it's, it was just a matter of time and growth. And mm. I think I give it a lot of, like, I think college sports have such an amazing, they are super amazing because they develop the athletes. It does such a, it's four years, but it's, critical four years, I think. Oh yeah. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and, um, I mean, I have a couple questions for you, but you know, one thing I'm, I'm, I'd be curious to hear your perspective and sometimes people don't enjoy talking about themselves, but like, you know, for you, what is it that sets you apart as a player? You know, like, <laughs> like, I guess what, what is it that you think sets you apart from the others? And especially in those last two years in college, like what started putting you ahead of the rest of the pack? Yeah, that's always a, a really hard question for me to answer because, and I never give like a this, this, and that. Like it's always yeah. uh, broccoli, lots of sleep, and <laughs> right, uh, phenomenal right. footwork. Yeah. Right. Um, I think uh, I think I've always been a player who is like creative, and I feel like every mm. midfielder says I'm a midfielder. Yeah, every midfielder says that. <laughs> like I'm just a creative. I have vision, but at least during the college years, um, I, I always bring up the fact that we had a lot of chemistry. You know, I was, mm -hmm. I was, a, I feel like I was a leader by example. Okay. Um, but also like a lot of my success depended on the players around me, you know, so I can't talk right. about what I'm good at without talking about how good the people around me are as well, because I depend mm -hmm. on, uh, our chemistry and the the type of passes I receive as a midfielder at the timing before the mark gets to me, for example, then, but I think, yeah. I think what sets me apart is just, um, my technical skills allow me to, you know, keep the ball or, or maybe make decisions that people wouldn't expect. And so I think mm. it's like that unpredictability, like, keep the defenders like thinking and uncomfortable, you know, like if, if you're going to block this part, then I'm going to do this other thing, you know? So I try to stay unpredictable and I feel like I am like the a glue or bridge between the lines. Um, that would be no, that, say. <laughs> that, no, that is, that, I mean, it's, it's super interesting. Right. And some people would be like, they wouldn't even mention their team in the first five minutes yeah. of that. They'd be like, I am an awesome scorer. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, for you, like, how did you develop like that technical skill set? I feel like the technical part of me is my biggest or one of my biggest, uh, like strengths, mm. but that developed when I was, when my dad was training me <laughs> that developed when I was uh, playing pickup on my neighborhood, 
we yeah. would play um i always say we would put like two rocks like what two three yards apart of each other right and that was one of the goals two rocks yeah. on the other side and there's no rules so it's pick up you play you would use the houses at like <laughs> so there's a sidewalk and you would use that to like the, the ball bounces against the wall so you right so you like something like, like part, that. Of, part of the field yeah exactly yeah. exactly as if that was a player but like the ball just bounces off the wall and you keep playing like there's no rules so you got to figure out a way to beat the opponent and so that with i also would play soccer all the time in school um i would play it against boys but at that age though it's pretty uh equal yeah in terms of like physicality um mm -hmm. but also my dad would coach me um constantly like uh, more formally like every saturday because he would coach a group of kids um he mm. would take me and my brother um so that was literally the foundation i feel like of my uh style of play uh mm. later on like i started to learn about you know tactics and how to move where to move positions but uh the foundation for me was uh when i was a kid just like yeah just how to control the ball like how to think quick how to be creative think out of the box kind of thing so it, have you man i think it's um malcolm gladwell's outliers have you ever read that book mm, no okay it's worth a read you might you might find some of yourself in it cool. uh but i think it's i think it's malcolm gladwell's outliers anyways if it's not i'll, I'll follow up at the end of the show with, with what it is um but that that is like one of the characteristics of uh, soccer definitely but a lot of these players who come from other countries outside of the U.S. and like their style of like backyard play uh, yeah. is very different than the actual confines of the game. So like they play in either a much smaller area or they play with obstacles or a much smaller ball or and, uh, you know, there's a lot of research that says like the, the creativity that comes out of playing that game and thinking outside the box translates usually to an athlete who's a lot more creative on the mm. field or like has a greater technical skill set so um it's interesting to hear that you just you know kind of like reference a lot of those things in your background because i remember reading them like oh wow i've been yeah sure. i've been playing in a full gym my whole life no wonder <laughs> parents, that's, parents, true. that's true that's yeah, true i actually yeah, in the um i have a, a couple of friends who work with academies here in the oh, okay. u.s and it's it, they say like it's become a problem how even sometimes it's the parents too like how can we get better like you get so competitive that it's almost counterproductive and right. there's a there's a time for everything and when you're a kid you have to just enjoy the game like let the amazing things about kids is that they they're so creative and they play they think so out of the box right. so th that's just like the phase where you're at and you have to live it once mm -hmm. you you know you keep growing then you learn different things but I feel like it's become so competitive, like academies want to win games and tournaments. And so they are starting to, you know, put kids in, in a such structured environment that it's, it's actually not great. Um, but it's just interesting that you mentioned that because it, I feel like it happens mostly in the U.S. because sports is such a huge thing. Like there's no mm -hmm. other country, I feel like, that in a way you have to have – you have to invest – in sports here to to make it to the top whereas in other countries you usually just play you don't have to necessarily pay to play hmm. so it's an interesting thing well and what's what's scary too so I, i've got three kids my daughter is now six and uh you know I'm, I'm not i'm not out with her in the backyard six days a week running uh wind sprints but it's you know it's yeah it's it's crazy like a lot of parents in this country at least take it way too far right. um and and they tr they take the fun out of the game and i know you mentioned that you even experienced burnout i think in high school um but i think that i think that's a real risk right it's like if you make it so structured then you mm -hmm. put so much pressure on these kids at a young mm -hmm. age like you're 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 kind of like I said, taking taking their legs out from underneath them because you've stolen the love of the game, right? And yeah. you you've professionalized it way before <laughs> they were ready for that. Yeah. Um, no, so so I don't know. Interesting to hear your take on that as well. Um, what, one question I had for you is: Are, are while you were in college, were you having to balance uh, you know commitments to the the Costa Rican national team at that time too, or did that kind of start towards the end of of your college career? No, I had to always. 
balance it out. Like if I would get mm. called, um, that was actually a conversation I had with the coaches before I even went to Penn State. Um, but our coach herself uh, had been had worked with the the senior U.S. Women's National Team as well. So she um, oh, sure. she was well aware and. It was always like, yeah, like we'll also always support you with the national team. So um, if there was a call up, uh, I would just have to notify, you know, the professors and my coach, and then we would work it out. It was. Yeah. Yeah, how it was long fun. would you, how long would you be away when when you would have to like go play with the team? Usually, it would be for the like tournaments. So I mean, the, mm. uh, that most at most what two weeks, two weeks away. Oh, okay. Um, so when you go play with the national team, it's not like there's like this long training camp leading up to these tournaments where you get to build chemistry and the team nah, like, you know, no. knows how to work together. <laughs> it's like, you're an all-star team. Nah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. It exactly. Grown together. exactly. Oh, exactly. It's, um, it, that's, a, that's a, another thing that I wish was different. It's like, we, how can you expect results when you don't, invest that's just, like it sounds basic mm. but it doesn't happen um no we would get called up for the tournament so if you are in the country back then i believe um you would get called like a couple weeks or days before and the people who were local you know they would have been playing at least at least more but i would fly directly to the to the tournament so really? yeah so <laughs> It's very That's different. Wild. Like I said, it's just two different realities. Like you and and the best teams in the world, they usually plan the year or at least have a tentative like schedule for the year. They have camps. They have um, yeah. They, there's some sort of continuity, right? Mm. To get right so that when you get to the like performance tournament where you have to compete and have to win, that's like you're ready, right? But we. We're not there yet, <laughs> and I don't know what has to happen, but it's like like you said it exactly like you'll get called up, you know, let's get a quick like organized like organizer players like and let's just hope for the best oh wow so so I mean what what happened with that team in two thousand fifteen because that's the first time the Costa Rican women's team yeah has has ever qualified for the World Cup. Was that was that just uh, kind of you know you had a year where there were a lot of fantastic athletes all kind of around the same time and, and you're just able to get it out or was there great chemistry like yeah I so the one thing I will say uh, in Costa Rica because there's not many players the ones that we have we really have to take care of <laughs> so a uh, uh, the bigger group of us had been playing together since forever since okay. years ago. Yeah. Um, and at that time, it seemed like we were all like in a, like for, for what was our level, we were mm. all in a good place. So yeah, like it, it happened that year, but like, that's the thing, like, even though we wouldn't have many days of preparation for the tournaments, we still knew each other from years ago. Mm. So at least I know, like my, t I know this teammate so well, you know, I know what, like what to expect from her. She knows what to expect from me sort of thing. So I think because of everything that we had already been through literally from years ago, um, it's, it's a double edged sword because you always have the same people, you know them so well, but at the same time, you don't produce players. You like, if you don't perform, we, we need you to perform. Like we can't afford that. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. there's no, not that competition of like, Oh, if you're not performing, you're going to either ne get bent or not called. Up. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, so, but yeah. for that year, it was just, it was a good year for us and, and it happened. Uh, I believe also the world cup was in Canada and mm. I think, I think there was like another open spot where usually there wasn't. And oh, so really? that that helped, but I yeah. But you guys played. I mean, I had but a lot we of fun. Still, well, we were still second. We were second. It was a U.S. us, so we qualified second. You right. Know, we well, were and over then, Mexico. Yeah, and then in that first round, I mean, what you had two draws, and then the, 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 just the last Oof. game, I think, was a loss to Brazil or something, right? Like it's oh, you guys yeah. played really really well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it was our first time ever. We were playing against uh, Spain the first game. Mm -hmm. It was their first World Cup as well. Um, oh, okay. Yeah.
but they were I think that they were expecting to win because their league is uh it's more developed than ours like it's Spanish it, arrogance. Yeah, this, yeah yeah they were like they were insulted <laughs> they were insulted that they had tied against us oh God, I know I that, that for a fact I, I love that yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. that's awesome <laughs> Um, how, how, I mean, you know, for you, so what you were, was that, were you still a senior at Penn state? That was the summer before my senior season. Oh, wow. I mean, you know, what, what did that, that mean to you? Cause like you said, from a young age, you knew you wanted to be a professional soccer player. And I, I, what's, I mean, not to make it more than it was, you know, but no one from your country, you're like the women's team had never gone to the world cup. Like how amazing was it to actually like achieve that? Um, you know, while you're having such amazing on the field success at Penn State. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> no, I just, I mean, you know, like how, 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 um, you know, how, how special was that for you to be oh, able yeah, to yeah, yeah. to go to the World Cup yeah. with Costa Rica? It was, it was a dream come true. Like the whole country, yes, the whole country was watching, but I couldn't stop thinking about how many women were watching us who played soccer before us. And they, mm. I know for a fact that they were living it through us. Like we were presented them. Yeah. And so for me, it was not only, I was living my dream, but I was living the dream of a, a whole, a huge population in Costa Rica. And right. so it was bigger than, it was really big. It was bigger than my own dreams too. It was like a, a big group of women's dreams as well. And then, I also scored on that on that game. I was the first one who scored for a national team. Um, we tied just one one. But I remember, <laughs> I can't believe I want to say this again. No, I love yeah, please, please. But I was crying. <laughs> oh yeah, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> I was crying on oh, our way bet. back to the hotel because I I was just like reflecting and I was like, it, it could have been anyone who scored, mm -hmm. but it was me and. I wanted to be the first one, don't get me wrong, but you know, like I, I always want to be the first one to score or the one to score. Um, yeah. But still, like it could have been anyone. And so I was just feeling so grateful. It wasn't a win, you know, but it, it represented so much more. Yeah. Even if it was a tie, like don't get me wrong, I would have loved to win. Um, mm. But it was it was a lot of everything. So yeah, to me to live the World Cup was, and, and also, you know, like, some players get injured before going to these competitions and they're, they've been training the, for the oh, full, their whole life. Yeah. Their yeah. whole life for that. And then shit happens. Yeah. I don't <laughs> and, get to realize and it. like, you know, so, so yeah, it was, it was amazing. My coaches went to watch that game. Oh, actually. did they? Yeah. Awesome. The whole co coaching staff was there and they got to, and they were and they were probably like, oh, God, we are going to just wreck people next yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're super excited. <laughs> One of them um, also cried. She came to the hotel after, and she was like, you're like just crying. She was like, oh, my gosh, you scored in the World Cup. Like, because they know uh, they knew how much it meant to me as well. Like, they had been with me through the journey. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> well, and, and you said it had a huge impact on all those those women who came before and played. I yeah. mean, what what did that do uh, for that younger generation of female athlete in Costa Rica? I mean, did, did you notice, uh, a, like, was there a big change, like a lot of enthusiasm around young female athletics? I think so. Like, I think so. Um, I feel like that was like the first time that I really felt like, the whole country, like not only our families, were aware of it. <laughs> um, and actually, after that World Cup, Costa Rica hosted a couple of years after, um, hosted a U-17 World Cup. Oh, um, very cool. We were supposed to host a World Cup this past January, the U-20s, but COVID uh, hit. Of course. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but um, so it. It, it, it did, right? <laughs> it did something. Um, but I feel like it's very... In Costa Rica, at least, it's very emotional. So it's like the World Cup was happening at that moment. Everyone's like, oh, my God, super cool. And then a couple, like the next year, it's like back to square one. Mm. And I was like, I, I thought it was going to be different. I, I could have, I was like, okay, this is it. Like, This is a tipping point, yeah. Yes, yeah, the, the changing point or whatever. And yeah, yeah. it wasn't necessarily that. 
Hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. I mean, like you've already kind of uh, talked about this a little bit, but it's, it's clear like how much um, investment and structure, like you were saying, like the Mexican league, they weren't letting in outside players. Like they're going to develop talent domestically. Um, Yeah. It's crazy. Um, You know, so, so looking ahead a little bit, now a professional athlete uh, and what I, I imagine with access to a lot of great resources, um, you know, like w- what are you kind of doing today to, to not only continue to perform at a high level, but, you know, see and have longevity in your career? Like mm-hmm. how, how has your training changed? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, every once in a while I sneak one in. <laughs> um. Well, I, I, I think in general, I've always been like a very, um, like I, yeah, I take, I I like to take care of my body and I like to, yeah, to do what's best for it. Um, Mm. I think as the years have gone by in the past, I've let's an example, just with food, for example, I've gone through so many phases. Um, but the way how I feel today with my relationship with food is very much like a balance. You know, I, Mm. I have tried like being very, uh, strict with food and that doesn't, it just doesn't work with me. I'll then like go crazy with food and like eat junk food and like, I just can't do that. Um, so to me, it's like, I've learned and and I've been working with a sports nutritionist from home. She's, oh, okay. she works with uh, the Olympic committee. Awesome. Um, but she, I feel like gave me a different perspective of seeing food as, as fuel. And it sounds mm. super basic. Uh, you would think, oh my gosh, like, I mean, I've been playing professionally, what, six years. And like, I'm just realizing this now, <laughs> like, but I feel like <laughs> last year, you know, like it's, it's an interesting relationship. I feel like I was actually just, I wanted to talk in in my podcast about like body image and, you know, it's, it's really common in athletes and like just mental health in regards to body image and and your relationship with food. Um, it, it can get in the way of performance, you know? So I think the way how I view food is I love to eat. Um, in general, I enjoy food so much but the way I see it, it's it's fuel, and the quality of that fuel is going to affect my performance. That doesn't mean uh, that I yeah. can't once in a while enjoy my sweets. I'm a sweet tooth, um, mm-hmm. but I think uh, in the past I always thought that I was unfit because I was eating too much, and that would lead me to eat less. And it's like a a very horrible cycle because then you eat even yeah. less, and then you think you're unfit because you're eating like it's it's bad. Um, right. And like the demands of what you're doing day to day to require, right. require a lot of fuel. Yeah. You're not, you're not going to the office and just sitting in front of a computer nine to five. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then it's your fuel, but it's also uh, what you use to recover. Like one of the mm. biggest things to recover too. And in regards to even um, like uh, injury prevention, like food has a lot to do with that as well, but also hmm. my habits. Um, I feel like I, I I'm in an age, I'm not super old, but. Yeah, I'm no, and I hope I didn't frame that. Qu- <laughs> oh, no, People no, no. are listening and they're like, this asshole. Is this, <laughs> do you just call her old? <laughs> no, it's funny. I mean, I make jokes about it too. So. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I have this routine at night as well where I I just roll out, it literally just rolling out stretch before oh, okay. I go to bed because I know that if I don't do that, um, I'll feel stiffer the next day. Mm. Um, so. Do you hear that alarm? Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Don't worry. Are you are you in Portland? The the city of Portland. Gosh, yeah, it is Portland. So many alarms. <laughs> uh, uh, no worries. Do I'm gonna repeat that part? Let me get some water. Oh, you no, you're good. Yeah, get get some water. No, and that um, that's interesting about the rolling out. So, like, when you're rolling out. Are you using one of those, um, like, you know, the, the trigger point rollers? I literally you know, okay. use a softball. Oh, use a softball. I okay. Use softball because oh, that's for a me, torture device. yeah, <laughs> I like to, um, I don't know what that's called, but just stay on that, like a trigger, like a one point yep, and just yep. count and breathe in, breathe out. And like, that's how I feel like I get more loosened up. Um, oh yeah. Especially like in my hips, my glutes, those are like 
very important points that I know that I have to take care of and yep. quads. So basically my whole, <laughs> all nice, my legs. Yeah. <laughs> all, all, all important. <laughs> all important. Uh, yeah. And then just stretch a little bit and it, it, it keeps me healthy and it keeps me loose and my range of like range of mobility or range of yeah. motion. Um, yep, yep. So those are like the habits that I know I I know will keep me healthy and like you said, like make my career a little longer. Um, mm. it, yeah. I, 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 well, and I think, I think, I think what's interesting there too is, you know, like that's a pretty broad question, but like you immediately went to like, no food and not just like, Oh, I, I count my macros and I do this and that. Right. It was like, I changed my relationship with yes. food. Um, and it's funny, we, we, the, the last episode before this, actually, we just had a nutritionist on by the name of um, Dr. Goglia. And he works with, you know, I mean, Marvel superheroes, NFL athlete, whatever. But, <laughs> you know, his like one piece of advice was like, look, like it's got to be sustainable. Like there's so much shit that you could be doing. But like if it's not sustainable, then like it's, you know, it's, it, it's not going to work out for you in the long run. And I kind of feel like I heard the same thing from you a little bit there. Absolutely. You heard exactly what I was trying to say. And, mm. and that's what I meant. Like I went through, I used to count my macros. Okay. It, it worked for a little bit, but I couldn't see myself doing that for the rest of my life or at least for the rest of right. my like soccer career life. Uh, it's yeah. not sustainable. That's literally what I said. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. I think I found, I, I'm finally in a place where I found like that balance that I can, um, get the most and and the most sustainable through time and get the most out of it too. Yeah. Well, and, and since you brought up the podcast too, maybe, maybe we deviate a little bit here. And I, I told you this, but I don't think I said it while we were recording, but um, what, I was introduced to you by Dr. Minson at the University of Oregon. Um, and, you know, as, as I, as I kind of learned more about your career and, you know, just um, started following you in general, I was, I've been very uh, interested in a lot of the things you have to say outside of soccer. And the mm. one word that comes to mind for me is conscientious, right? Like very thoughtful, your approach, and you have a lot of great conversations. What I can understand in English, my Spanish is uh, embarrassingly bad. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I'm just like, it, it seems that you have a lot of very sincere passions outside of soccer. Um, so, I, you know, I, I would love for you to talk a little bit about what your, your podcast is and kind of what led to you starting to do that. For sure. Um so my podcast is called The Seed of the Day. Mm -hmm. um, I currently just do it in Spanish um, to start just because I've found that like uh, it's what I can get right now with soccer and, and now that I picked up also playing the piano. Uh, oh, very I like, cool. Yeah. I like, so I'm doing like a lot of random things. So I, yeah. yeah, in order to, again, keep it, keep it going, like I figured let me just do uh, the podcast once in a while in Spanish, cause I used to do it both in Spanish and English. Mm -hmm. Um, but how it started is, um, I guess it started when I was going through like a, a rough season. Uh, it was an off season actually. And I was just having like a lot of conflict with another person, <laughs> my boss at the time, this yep. is another job outside of soccer. And, ah, okay. um, and so I one day decided to, I was, I mean, I was driving to work and I was like, you know what? Like, I'm just going to be grateful for, hmm. you know, the car that I have right now that I can come and whatever. And I decided to share that on social media and I just kept doing that. And I named it the seat of the day because me and a friend just had that joke, like whatever she would bend with me. And I was like, I gave her like my five cents about it. And I was like, yeah, then that's your seat for the day. And it just came, <laughs> the title just came out from a joke. Um, that's awesome. so I literally put the hashtag there. And so that's, so then I stopped doing that and people were like, Oh, like where's the seat of the day? Like we miss it. And I was like, Oh, like people are actually reading and listening. Like, right. Cause it started as a joke. So I decided to be like more like intentional and just formalized. And at that time I was doing, uh, like a, four minute video every week, like once a week. Um, and that's how it started. Um, eventually. Hmm. So the, the first season I call it, um, it's all on my social media too, but, uh, I made 42 
seats of the day. Um, yeah, that's, that's a, a lot of commitment. As someone who as, as someone who has a podcast, <laughs> exactly. I'm telling you people that's a lot of commitment. Okay, it's a lot exactly, <laughs> exactly. So then, then the pandemic hit, and I was like, let me just take a break. Um, and I picked it up this year again uh, in podcast format. And um, awesome, yeah. That's great. Well, and, and let me ask you this too. Um, you know, where where are you looking to for like inspiration or for positivity or you know to help you, um, you know, keep like a positive mindset? Like, yeah. where does that come from? Yeah, yeah um, I guess uh, in it depends on where I'm at in life, <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm always like because I know I'm doing the podcast, I always keep it in the back of my mind, so I'm always like in mm-hmm. the lookout. So whether it's a conversation with a friend, um, or right now I have been on the, I haven't read much, but like last year and the year, the previous year, I was reading a lot too. So, yeah. um, I would get ideas from, from, uh, the things I would read, even experiences or like reflections on my own about an experience, you know, and that's mm. how it actually started. It was like, listen, like I was doing this and then I, I thought, well, how about this other perspective? And yeah. that's how we started. It was literally just sharing my take and my perspective on on an experience that I just had. Um, yeah. And I, I just enjoy, I, I enjoy like talking about reflections and like perspective and always taking the, like a lesson out. Like yeah. it doesn't matter what happens. It's like, what do you learn? And hmm. I think just that it, there's always something to say. Yeah. And, and do you pr- approach uh, your athletic career the same way? I definitely try to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it, it really is incredible, you know, because oftentimes, uh, you know, I myself, I'm like, is, are people taking anything away from this? I'm like, do they really want to hear about what? I, and it, it really is incredible how powerful it can be to share. And especially like if you can put positivity back out there or an insight that helped you get through something. Um, man, that stuff is so powerful. So. Uh, very cool. And I can see why people demanded that seat of the day come back <laughs> after that initial short hiatus. Um, <laughs> Hopefully. Well, cool. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. Looking, looking forward, cause I know I've kept you for almost an hour here. Um, you know, what, what's, what's kind of next for you uh, in your athletic career. So this will hopefully be your first full season with Portland, right? I know last year was just brutal with the pandemic. Um, you know, what, what's kind of your, your near and long-term goals athletically? Yeah. Um, it's really interesting because, uh, I feel like Portland is a a club that I, or, or, oh, I can't talk right now. (laughs) No worries. Okay. Portland is a club that I always dreamed of, uh, Mm. to play with. And it's because it's like just a very professional club, very competitive. I always Mm -hmm. said I wanted to be in the, one of the best teams in the world with, you know, the best players in the world. Um, yep. And I feel like this is it. Um, so to me, when I was here last year, it was, it was, it took a lot for me to get to Portland, you know, let alone, mm-hmm. I mean, we talked a little bit about how I started then college. And then um, I was drafted to, to sky blue, but yeah. um, even coming to Portland, which sky blue was a great experience as well. I like, I grew a lot from it. Um, mm-hmm. But I knew it wasn't necessarily a club where I wanted to stay. But mm-hmm. Portland is a club that I always imagined I would I would play with, and it's the club that I wanted to play with. So now mm-hmm. that I'm here, um, before I got here, I would always be like, okay, I know I want to like always ahead and like, okay, what's right, my right, next right. step? But now that I'm here, I'm like, I want to enjoy it <laughs> because this is it. I'm really happy here. Um, yeah. I have the challenges that I was looking for. And, um, I guess for me, the next steps, uh, in soccer, it's, I still haven't won an NWSL championship and I feel like this is the club to, to do that. Yeah. Um, but like I said, it's like interesting because my whole life I was, I always knew where like, it was like, okay, national team. Okay. Once I'm done with, uh, high school, college, what's next professional what's next mm-hmm. like okay the best club but now i'm here it's weird because i'm like i don't know what's next i know for sure it's like i always in the past wanted it was in the back of my head to i want to play in europe but that's mm-hmm. because in my head the best clubs in the world were there but 
the NWSL is one of the best leagues in the world as well, and Portland is one of the best teams in the NWSL. Um, right. We have to prove that, of course, but historically, historically, it's been like that. So, yeah. so for me, it's like, okay, let me grow and leave a legacy in mm. Portland. I don't know how long I'll be here, but I do know that wherever I go, I, I like to to leave a legacy. And yeah. um, so for me, what's next? It's yeah, f- very punctual uh, end of cell championship. That's awesome. Well, okay. So, so let me ask you this. And I, I've always been interested in this, right? Like when you kind of started this conversation, it was like, my goal is to be a professional soccer player. And you've, you know, you played in college at the highest level. You've gone to the world cup. You're now to your point, right? In a fantastic soccer league, one of the best in the world and one of the best clubs in that league you know at any point like do do you like pause and just try to appreciate that is that even possible you know because i i I, what we often hear is the person who didn't make it Mm -hmm. oh my life would have been so great if i just could have done xyz or i just came short or i didn't get the break but like you know having put yourself in a position to live out your dream you know like can you even appreciate it I, I think so. I, now that you say that, um, last year was a pandemic year, but that was my first year in Portland. So it was mm-hmm. it was a weird thing because I was really looking forward to um, – Portland is one of the only places in the world that the stadium gets packed to watch the women's team. I was going to say, that it's a bummer that your first year was during COVID because, <laughs> exactly. like, it, yeah, Portland – I mean, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and okay. uh, they love their soccer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and I know Portland is just, they're crazy about it. Exactly, exactly. And um, it, it, it really is a bummer. Uh, <laughs> but um, still, uh, I feel like during the pandemic year, I was like, okay, like, yes, it's a pandemic and everything, but I am here. Like, mm. it's still like, I'm here. It, it's been a wild journey and it's like I had worked so much for it. And I actually made a video that I haven't posted yet because um, there were rules about like not posting, like when you go to training or whatever, but I am oh, waiting to launch it um, whenever it hits the, the one year mark when I made that video. And it's oh, actually, cool. it's literally, I, I'm speaking in Spanish on the video, but it's literally about, hey, like pinch yourself and look how far you've gotten, like telling people this, but I'm saying that because that's what I'm realizing at the moment. So um, up to this day, even like, there's definitely days where I just go through the motions, I gotta go to work, like you even whine about it. (laughs) But there's other days where I'm like, just wow, like I'm standing by these amazing players. Mm. I have this uniform on, like, I, you know, like it's, I, I do have those days and yeah. I think it's so important to have that because like, like, I don't want to look back and be like, man, if I would have enjoyed it more or like mm. I had it, I, I was happy. I just didn't realize it or, you know, stuff Absolutely. like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's something that the average person deals with too. It's like, uh, you know, look, like if I, if I talk about myself for a second, like I, you know, li- life can be difficult. It can be stressful. Yeah. And it, there's those times where like I have these three little kids and my wife and I'm like, oh man, like I need to take a stop and just yeah. find, I need to find a way to appreciate this because I'm, I am I, like, to your point, I'm going to look back and be like, those were the best years. Yes. And it's, it's so easy to be so focused on like moving forward or that next thing mm-hmm. that, you know, that, that whole idea of being present, it's uh, easier said than done. So mm-hmm. very cool to, to hear that uh, you're making a conscious effort to do that. And I think there's a, a lesson in that as well. For sure. No, for sure. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, nothing else needs to be said there. Perfect. Well, hey, so for for people who want to follow you, wh- where should I point them? Because you do do a great job of uh, posting. Well, um, yes. For the people who would like to follow me, please follow me on uh Rocky Rocky. So it's R-A-Q-U-E underscore Rocky. Uh, mm. That's for Twitter and Instagram. Um, my YouTube channel, uh, I post all the videos or most of the videos. Um, it's Raquel Rocky Rodriguez. And yep. Facebook, it's also Raquel Rocky Rodriguez or Rocky Rodriguez. One of those. Awesome. 
And, and the podcast, I'll, the, I'll I'll make sure to link to it. Oh yes, Spotify, Apple is is it everywhere for the most part. Yes, for the most part, but definitely Spotify. And, awesome. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, man, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I know people are going to take a lot away from this one. I hope so. It was amazing to talk to you, Ken. And thank you so much for the invite.